Okay, uh, our next presenter is a guest from uh, the Netherlands and he's working with the Internet Archive. If you don't know of the Internet Archive, it's a great organization that preserves data of the ephemeral data on the Internet. Uh, and, uh, well, go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, the topic is open source OCR and the PDF compression that they're doing. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Merlin. Uh, I work for the Internet Archive since uh, five or six years. And I'll be talking to you about our switch from uh, non-open source software to uh, uh, open source software in the last year for much of our uh, document processing. Um, I will first talk about OCR, what OCR is, uh, how you can use it. And then uh, after that, I will talk about PGF generation and compression. Uh, they're technically two separate to topics, but I think they are uh, very related here. So who knows what OCR is? Can you raise your hand if you know what OCR is? Like four or five people? Six? Okay. <laughs> um, so OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, and it's basically the process of reading text on a photo with a computer. So if you, if you uh, make a photo and you read it on your screen, you, you know how to read. You know what the characters are. So as a person, you just know what it says. But a computer often doesn't know what is written on the photo at all. So that's uh, relatively tricky. Um, but it's very useful because if you upload photos somewhere, it's actually very nice to know what is on the photo so you can find them later. So we, we use it for document analysis, exploration, and accessibility. So what does that mean? Well, for example, if we uh, digitize books, which we do at very large scale with the Internet Archive, it's very nice to know uh, what page is what page number, or where does a chapter start. And if we analyze all the text on the page, we can find, like in the corner, it will say 42 for a page number. And if we can find that, that means we can link to specific pages. And we do that, for example, with Wikipedia. If there are certain references to a book on Wikipedia, you can find it on the archive, and it will jump to the specific page because we found that page number using OCR. Uh, another thing that we do is we create other formats. So if you um, upload a book as photos, um, for example, if you take a book and you make a photo of every page, and you make a file and you upload that to us, we will run OCR and then we will make an EPUB from it. And the EPUB is entirely based on what the computer can find on the photos. So sometimes there will be a typo, but generally, uh, it's quite neat, and also it's very small, so you can download it in a fraction of a second, whereas the entire book and all the photos are, are very large, and they don't rescale uh, to uh, other displays, like small displays. Um, and we also make PDF and uh, plain text files. Uh, and one other thing that I, I find v uh, personally very exciting is that because we can get all the text from all the books, you can also search all the text of all the books that we have for specific keywords. So if you want to know, you know, um, when did Linux become popular, you can see how many books contain the word Linux over time, because you can see what year uh, each of the books were published. Uh, or if you're a historian and you want to you find other information, this is also very, a very powerful feature. Um, yeah, so I said we, we do uh, a lot of digitization every year. Uh, this graph is, I think, uh, pretty recent. I hope you can read it. Um, but basically, we are digitizing about we are OCRing about 3 million pages per day. So that means people upload some stuff to us, and we also digitize our own books. And in total, 3 million pages uh, every day are OCR'd by us. And I think that amounts to probably 30 to 40 per second. So that's pretty quick. Um, don't pin me on that number, because I did a, ver a very quick calculation there. OK, so um, I mentioned at the start that we were moving to an open source stack, which I think is, is one of the main interesting points here. Um, and that all started in 2020 in August when we decided we wanted to move from our closed source software uh, to open source. So we were moving away from Abbey Fine Reader. Um, and we were trying to evaluate, well, what can we do? What's, what OCR software can we use instead of Abbey uh, that is close enough in quality but free software so we can improve it and, and make changes? Um, I had personal prior experience with Tesseract, which is one of the main OCR engines, and I used another project where we uh, disqueued all the images that were uploaded. So um, uh, some people uploaded microfilm to our uh, website, and then uh, pages on microfilm are, it's a very old format that you can find in libraries, and 
people would make a photo of a book that would go on the film, and then you can look back at the film, and sometimes the pages were a bit turned because they just didn't quite have the book right. And then I used Tesseract to find all the text and then straighten it up. Uh, and and, and, and I, I already found that Tesseract was quite powerful there. There are a couple of other available engines. There's Calamari and Ocropy. And there's a, load, a, a big uh, uh, set of different um, result files. So uh, if a computer does OCR, it can just give you the text in like characters, but that doesn't tell you what text is where or what the structure is, so that is not always convenient. And there are various structured formats for, for representing OCR results. There's Abby XML from the Fine Reader. There's Alto, Page XML, HOCR, and, and a bunch more. Um, we ended up using Tesseract as an engine and HOCR as a, a format. So that was a, um, after evaluating the quality of Tesseract and the other engines versus Abby, Tesseract was actually performing really well. Uh, and HOCR was a, a, a maintained and well-defined but simple format, but still powerful enough, power, powerful enough for what we wanted to do. OK, so what does this look like? Uh, I've said OCR a lot and, and, and uh, what it does. But this is a typical example. So this is some um, magazine, some, some uh, serial. And what you're looking at is a screenshot that I made of a tool that takes an OCR result. So Tesseract runs, it finds text, it saves that to a file, and then you can interactively view what it found. Uh, you will absolutely not be able to read the very fine print here. You can see this word, but not here. Uh, so it draws a rectangle about around every word that I found, and also the text in that box. Uh, and you can interactively explore, um, hide the background, scale the text, and see what the reading order is. So if you're debugging something or you want to just fix it up, this is uh, one of the tools to use. I turned that into a service. So for example, for this specific uh, uh, book, if you click on this URL, you will see the same thing, and you can interact with all the pages and, and go through them. Um, I didn't write the software. It was uh, a JavaScript-based thing um, made by Konstantin, and you can, you can find it here. I'm assuming that the uh, slides will be made available after the talk when I, when I share them, so then you can actually uh, click on the links. Um, and another thing that we do, like I said, is PDF generation. I'm going to touch on that a lot more after this, but uh, just to give you an idea. So um, this is the same page that we're looking at in the other slides. But I have selected, I'm just going to walk a bit, I have selected text here. And that text is only there because we did OCR, right? If you have just a photo of something and you put it in a PDF, there's no text selection at all. But we insert a text layer when we make PDFs so that you can actually search through them and select text. And if you're reading a book for when you're studying and you really just want to copy a couple sentences, you don't have to type them over. You can just copy them. Uh, so this is, I think, one of, one of the main really cool things for OCR. Just take a photo and suddenly, there's a text layer. I mean, there's more going on in the background, but uh, yeah. And of course, you can search. So I, I'm searching for the word the here, and there's many parts highlighted in blue because my PDF viewer found the word the there in every, um, uh, uh, every occurrence of the word the, it highlighted them. OK, so what I said I personally found very interesting is full text search. So using our web interface on archive.org, you can do full text search in, in many things. Uh, but books is, is, is a big one. So you, I just typed the string Linux here. And I restricted my, um, my search to a specific collection of items that were magazines uh, early on about computers. So these are magazines around 90-something to 2000s. And the first mention of magazines of Linux is in March 1993. And I, Linux started in 1991. So that's pretty cool. Um, at least I think it, you can just find all these things that way. And then if you click on one of these results in our website, it will actually bring you to the specific page uh, where it founds the words, and also uh, the other occurrences. So in this case, uh, you can't read it, but I'll read it from my screen. It says, Yggdrasil Computing, a system uh, software uh, company, has begun shipping Unix clones. And they're like uh, $60, $60 uh, dollars for a, a floppy disk with Linux. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool that we, uh, we found that. Um, there were a couple big challenges with searching inside these items. So um, you can imagine if you have a big XML file of all the OCR data, uh, and if you search for something here on the website, we need to figure out where the word is. 
and what page it, it's on. And XML files can get very big, so some of them are 500 megabytes, and just parsing it all takes a long time. Um, so we, we came up with a way to, to speed that up, which is um, all, our, all our full text is in Elasticsearch, and when we search for a word, it tells us, OK, here's the entire text of the book, and I highlighted the words so that match. And then uh, we, max, we uh, match that to our own text version after reading the XML, and line by line check, OK, is there a match or not? So that, that takes quite a while. But what we ended up doing is already have the same plain text processed from the XML, but also we have a mapping for every um, XML element that is a page to uh, bytes in the plain text file. So if we know that there's only a match on page 100, we don't need to parse the entire XML. We just skip, I don't know, 50,000 bytes into the XML file, read a bit, and that's all we need to uh, uh, return the results. So suddenly, searches that took 30 seconds on the website are actually done in, in uh, less than a second. OK, so a little more on, on Tesseract. It was developed by uh, Hewlett Packard in the 1980s, open sourced, and they did some stuff with it, but um, it wasn't that top of the line. Then Google started working on it, and it got quite a lot better. Uh, they added a uh, neural network backend that, that was uh, much better than the previous engine they had. Um, and it supports a lot of languages. And that's very cool, because we get a lot of different content. Of course, it supports English and Arabic, but it supports uh, uh, Cyrillic, Russian, Bulgarian, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, all the different Arabic and Indian uh, scripts and languages. Um, and that's something we weren't able to do before with our closed source software. So we really uh, are able to OCR a lot more now. Um, it also features some uh, other cool things, like it can detect the script. So uh, you might remember uh, the Gothic script that was in use 70, 80 years ago. Um, we stopped using it after the Second World War, I think. But uh, it can usually detect if you have a photo of a page. It can figure out, OK, yeah, this is not uh, the modern font, but it's like one of the old fonts. And that means you have to OCR it differently. And it can also figure out if the page is uh, rotated or not. Um, again, when, I, when the PDF is online, you can find the list of support languages there. Um, and we were working with the Tesseract community a lot to get the speed up, because we were processing so many pages a day. Even a, a 2 or 3% increase means a lot, because we dedicate probably currently, while I'm talking here, more than 1,000 computer cores just to doing OCR. So if we get it 5% faster, that saves us some power and, and on resources. So after working with the Tesseract people, um, they, they made changes to new Tesseract 5, and it sped up by about 30%. So before, it would take 14 to 15 seconds per page to the OCR. And here, it, when we deployed it, it turned into like 10 seconds per page. So that was a really big improvement. And my boss uh, also tweeted about it. OK, so uh, the final thing I want to say about OCR, I think, here, um, is that I wrote the module in Python. So Tesseract is written in, in C++, but all the things around it I wrote in Python. And I also added heuristics for uh, script and language detection. So using Tesseract, I sample certain pages of a book to see, well, what script is it? Is it Fraktur? Is it Chinese? Is it Korean? What Chinese script is it? And um, I use all of that to determine what the likely script of something is that someone uploads. Of course, if they upload all the different, uh, a, a different mix of things, it gets more tricky. Um, but this is very useful because all of this is also stored in the metadata, so you can suddenly search for all the books that we detected that have uh, a certain script or font or language. Uh, the language detection is based on the OCR, so if we do the OCR, we get a lot of text, and then there's a simple Python library that you give all the text and tells you, well, this is probably German or English. Uh, but you can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can select a couple and then uh, combine with the confidence value um, you can also find documents that weren't properly labeled, but after we did OCR, we kind of knew what it was anyway. Uh, we compile our own Tesseract for, uh, in RCI uh, with a couple small patches, but uh, it's, it's here in the, in the sources online as well. Uh, and this is just a, a screenshot of, of the different metadata that, that it tends to write. So in this case, it detected the Gothic or Fraktur script with 100% confidence, and it was really sure it was German. So this is probably a very old uh, German newspaper. OK, uh, so the big challenges that I had here in, in, in OCR was XML documents are really large. And if you just read them all into memory, the computer freezes, especially when you have really large books, like with 5,000 5, pages. 
Um, so I had to spend a lot of time making everything streaming, so it only reads a bit, deals with that, then reads the next bit. Uh, it's almost as fast as that's, that's uh, dealt with. Quality comparison is really hard. If you compare Abbey Fine Reader with Tesseract, you can kind of read the text, but if they have a different reading order, so they think actually you're supposed to read this paragraph first, then it's very hard to do a, a, a difference check. So you have basically have to do it by hand. Um, another thing that was pretty hard is there's a lot of languages out there that I don't know. So if I'm evaluating if it read the uh, Hindi script right, I don't really know, so I have to <laughs> really peek just to see, or we have to ask an expert, like, is this really okay? Um, people upload really weird things to the archive, and the OCR had trouble dealing with some of that, so there was a lot of going back and forth and reiterating on, on, on solving problems that came up. And then, uh, honestly, the hardest part when I did this in August 2020 until uh, the end of that year was that I also had to do the PDF work, um, and that's what I'm uh, going to talk about next. Oh, oh, and by the way, uh, some of the OCR stuff I'm, I'm saying now, there's a presentation online at the Internet Archive where I go into some more detail, but none of that touches on PDF. So um, if you want to read some, uh, hear some more about OCR, there, there's a presentation online. Okay, um, PDF. How many of you know what PDF is? Please raise your hand. That's a lot more. Okay, good. Um, I wouldn't say it's like a Word document, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's pretty similar in the sense that people, uh, you know, it's just a document with photos and text. Um, it's typically vector graphics, although if you put an image in there, it, it, it's not. It's just rasterized. Uh, but it supports images, uh, text, and all kind of funky things. And I think the uh, less supported things also support forms. So sometimes maybe you, if you have to fill out a government form, you'll uh, have interactive uh, buttons you can click on. Uh, and we create a PDF for every book that we digitize. And actually, for most of the things that people upload, we also create a PDF. Uh, why do we do that? Because it's, very, uh, it's a very well-supported format. So if we have a book that we digitized and the images are 600 megabytes total because they're very high resolution, then uh, if someone wants to view the book on their phone or read it, then we don't want them to download 600 megabytes. So we create a very compressed PDF. Um, and our requirements were that we want the text layer in there. So if you're studying, you can copy the text, or you can do Control F and, and find things in the PDF. Um, and it needs to be a, a separate step, because we do OCR in a different module in our backend, and at some point we make a PDF. So it cannot be done at the same time. Um, we also want them to be really compressed. That's what I said earlier. And we use the uh, MRC. Uh, compression technique, which I will talk about more, which I think is uh, kind of cool. And then the PDFs need to be um, archival standard compliant. So there's a lot of different standards within PDF, uh, and some of them are a dumped down or a simple version of PDF where they only use very basic features, so none of the form stuff, uh, to make sure that 20 or 30 years from now we can still read PDFs. So the PDFs we make are PDF A uh, compliant. And they also contain certain hints for screen readers or people who are blind uh, to be able to still read what's, what's in, the, in the PDF. And it needs to be fast, because we do a lot of them. Uh, we, have, uh, we don't have infinite computing power. So then the question was, how much can we already do with free and open source software? What is already out there that we can just use that will save us time and, 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 and problems? So Tesseract, the OCR engine, can actually make PDFs. Um, the problem is it does it at the OCR step, so there's no separate step, and the PDFs it makes are not compressed at all. So if you have 600 megabytes of files, photos, and you OCR them, you get a 600 megabyte PDF. So that's, that's a problem. Um, there are some other tools. There's paperwork and OCR My, My PDF that people use for PDF generation, uh, but they also don't compress very well, and they also do everything at the same time. Um, and finally, uh, what I found to be a very useful tool was PyMUPDF, which is a very powerful Python library for the MUPDF library, which you can use to read, modify, and, and, and display PDFs. Yeah, so our solution to all of this was a, a two-step process, which was also in our requirements, so it's not weird that our solution looks like that. Um, but the big, th the big thing was that I took the Tesseract code that makes PDFs with text layers, because it was really good at that, I ported it to Python, and I just used, um, I ba basically reused their code, but the main changes were that it can read the HOCR files, the XML files that we make earlier on. So 
at that point we have the step separated, um, whereas TestRec can only read from its internal memory structure. So this is kind of cool. Now there's like a script that you can use to make a PDF with text layer, uh, but there are no images because we insert them later. So you have basically see nothing because the text is hidden while well, the, the text layer is there. And then the second step of our solution is that we change the PDF that we make with my test rate ported codes, and we insert very compressed images. And suddenly, then at the end, we have a PDF with a text layer and compressed images. Um, one thing I think that it's, by the way, very interesting to note, the test rate code is really good with the text uh, layer generation. One of the, I think, mistakes in the PDF standard is that uh, text is just something that's somewhere on the document, and there's no defined reading order. So depending on if you use Adobe Reader or Mac Preview or Evans or whatever you use, they might select text differently. They will have their own heuristics and algorithms to find out where text is and how it's supposed to be read. Uh, and TestRec, the, the people, they did a lot of testing and tried to make it work with everything, so it was a very natural uh, point to start because they, they basically did all the work already. Okay, um, so I talked a lot, or I mentioned MRC compression a couple times. Um, I will briefly explain what it does, um, and then I'll have some nice pictures to hopefully, uh, if you're bored, make it make more fun. Um, so MRC compression stands for mixed, mixed raster content compression, and it's a lossy compression method. So um, once you compress something, you cannot get all the original data back. But for us, that's fine, because most of the parts of the book we don't really care about. We care about the text, maybe some uh, images, but you know the exact background of the uh, book doesn't really matter to us. We care about the, the, the things that people read. So if we don't get that back after decompression, that's, that's fine. Um, so what the technique does, it takes a single image, and it turns into three different images. It creates a background image, and a foreground image, and a mask. And a mask is... Uh, how would I explain it? It's a, it's a one-bit thing that either says yes or no. Include this pixel or don't include this pixel. And we use the mask in combination with the foreground to um, put that image over the background. So what happens in the PDF, we insert a background image, and then another image is pasted on top with that mask. And the mask determines if the PDF should show the pixel of the foreground image or the pixel of the background image. I hope that was clear. Um, and then the background and foreground images are uh, highly compressed with a JPEG 2000. Um, how many of you know what JPEG 2000 is? One, two, three. OK. Um, you probably know JPEGs, which is a very common way to compress images. And uh, a long time ago, JPEG 2000 was invented, which compresses much better. But software support is pretty poor for it. Uh, there were some uh, licensing issues, I think. So people basically don't use it. No browsers support it. No phones support it. But they support it in the PDF standard. Um, and it compresses so much better that for our purposes, this was really the thing that we, we, we should use. And then the mask image is separately encoded using either something called JBIG2 or CCITT. Those are also uh, image compression standards supported in PDF. CCITT, I think, is what they use in fax machines. Um, so basically before, when you, were sending, when you were faxing something to someone, that was the compression they used. And JBIG is something slightly newer that compresses slightly better. Um, and optionally, because we really want to compress very aggressively, uh, the background usually doesn't contain that much inter interesting information for us, so we can make it smaller. We can downsample it. If it's 4,000 pixels, we can make it 1,000 pixels, and it's probably still fine for most viewing purposes. So how much does this compress? Um, if you take a comp completely uncompressed image, and most, most, most of the times they are compressed, uh, you can compress up to 500 times easily and still have a pretty readable thing. So if I have a, a letter that I get from the government at home, I put it on my scanner, I scan it and then compress it, it will t go from about, what did I say, seven, uh, 27 megabytes to 52 kilobytes. So that's really small. Um, if you do that with already compressed images like JPEG 2000s, you can get about a 10, 10x factor, which I think is still, still pretty big. Um, and that is, in fact, what we do. All the photos we make of books are also JPEG 2000s and then we make them uh, 10 times smaller. And uh, the quality and compression ratio, so how ugly or how much uh, um, compression artifacts do you get or not can be changed at runtime. So if you want to have a slightly better picture and you want it to be a megabyte instead of 52 kilobytes, you can, you can just change that uh, in the parameters. OK, so what does this look like? Um, 
I really hope that this is a little bit visible. This is a, a, a part of a photo of a book with a green background, and I think it's the second page. It just contains the publisher information. And this is the original image. And then this is the compressed image. Um, if you're watching on the stream, you can probably notice that there's a lot of small artifacts here, which is just induced by the camera. And in the compression, it's all gone because the background, again, is not interesting. Right, the background is just green. We can compress that very heavily. So this is what the background image looks like. Surprisingly, it's almost entirely green. Uh, so you can see that we basically took the image and removed everything that we think is the, is the foreground. Right? There's a lot of black pixels and text here. And we figured out that they're text. And we just make them similar to the, the pixels around the background so they all become green. And we can do the same for the foreground and apply some other techniques to make it very compressible. So this is actually the foreground image. And if you cannot read anything, that is entirely intended. Right? Most of the pixels are either black or green. And, but if we combine it with the mask, then suddenly everything is very readable. So this is what the mask looks like. You can see there's some noise here. And that's what, what causes like, the green rays here. But mostly it's just you know, the mask is, is on where the text is black. So that's when the foreground gets put on the background. And where every pixel is black, we just see the background. Um, here's another example, everything in one page with the init lab logo. Um, this was the, well, I don't have the original here, but it looked very similar. So this is the result, and you can see that was the background, which is kind of a, a vampiring looking <laughs> cute animal, and then the foreground is barely recognizable, and then the, the mask is exactly what you would expect it to be, which is the sharp lines and the things that really matter to us, except that now we have it in full color. Uh, cats, because everyone likes cats. Um, this is an image from Wikipedia. I have attribution at, at the end. Uh, so this is the original mag uh, photo. It's 11 megabytes. And then compressed. Oh, there, that's not readable. It's uh, 244 kilobytes. And you can see, well, you probably can't see it, but there is a small difference. But really, uh, it looks very similar. Um, this is what the background looks like. So all the sharp lines are kind of just removed, because all the sharp stuff is typically in the foreground. Um, and this is what the foreground looks like. And I think this illustrates quite well how the algorithm works. So it knows, using the mask, what parts are part of the foreground. And then it just kind of copies that color downwards until it hits another thing in the foreground. And then it changes color. So you can see all of that over there is very brown. But then when it hits the other cat, it turns grayish. And the reason that we do that is because if we leave everything black but only put a few foreground pixels in there, then if you compress it, then they all get very dark because all their surrounding pixels are black. Uh, so this is only to make it compress better at higher quality. And this is then uh, the mask. OK, so um, this there will be one or two slides. They're kind of technical. And then I'll, I'll get back to the less technical stuff. Uh, the mask generation, so the thing that's either on or off is a pixel foreground or background, is done by using a specialized binarization algorithm that is optimized for text. So people have been studying binarization for a very long time. And there's a method called Savola. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And uh, that's very good at, at recognizing text. So if it's part of text, it will be white. Otherwise, it will be black. And since we mostly care about the text, this was a very natural choice uh, to use. Um, but in addition, we also use the OCR XML files, which tells exactly where what text is, at least what Tesseract found, to do some more fine tuning of binarization. So we do another t type of local binarization wherever we, we think there is text. And then um, I think I kind of explained just now how we generate the foreground and background images. This used to be very slow. Uh, I rewrote it in Cython, which is a way to write in Python, but compile it to C code so it gets much faster. And then a very good friend of mine contributed a much faster version still. Um, so now I think we can easily compress one page per second on a single core, which is much better than the, the 10 seconds it was before. Um, all right. So just uh, uh, a recap of, of how, how all of this works. We run Tesseract on a, a, a set of images. Every image generates, uh, Tesseract generates an XML file for every image. We take all those small XML files and turn them into one big XML file. And that's then the end of the uh, OCR step. 
then uh, we make the initial PDF with just the text layer using that big XML file. And then we start reading the images, compressing them, and insert them, inserting them into that PDF. Uh, and finally, we, there's some code that makes the PDF archival standard compliant. We don't use a lot of special features, but you still have to tell it uh, uh, this is the color space I'm using. And yes, it is a archival compliant uh, PDF. Um, I have some more graphs here. So I will just read, read for you what it says, because it's probably very hard to read. We are currently, I think, producing about uh, 30 pages per second of PDFs as well, which matches what we do with OCR, because we make a PDF page out of every page that we OCR. Um, and at some point, it got a lot faster, because I deployed a newer algorithm. And that's better uh, seen here, where my initial code took about 20 seconds per page, uh, and then it went down to five. And those are really large images. If you do it with the typical image, it's, it's, it's much faster. And the same is true for the memory usage. Um, you can see that here. Um, suddenly, when I deployed my new codes, the memory usage dropped from, on average, 2 gigabytes or 1.5 gigabytes to, on average, about 400 megabytes. And this is only the, the, the average. If you look at the, really, the, the big spikes, it was much worse. Uh, all right, so everything that I've told you about and shown you is all open source, and everything is uh, AGPL v3, so the uh, Aviro license. Uh, you can find it all here. Uh, some stuff is still hosted on our internal Git. So the www slash module is our internal Tesseract module that uh, does heuristics and text detection and runs Tesseract. And then the archive HOCR tools are all the Python tools that I wrote to deal with HOCR files, to be able to search with them, to combine them. Um, and the, the archive PDF tools are the MRC compression and PDF generation tools. Um, these two pages contain more documentation on how it works at the Internet Archive. And if you want to upload stuff to us, what do we do with it? Um, and I have some documentation for the HOCR tools, but not yet for the PDF ones. There is some documentation, but not a lot. Um, what I should really mention is that during all of this, the, the community was very helpful. There's, uh, if you really like OCR, there is a group called OCRD, which are funded by the German government and, and other people. And they, um, they are really good at very high quality OCR. The downside is that it takes a long time to process some pages, so it wasn't, wasn't an option for us. But if you have historical old text, say you have uh, um, maybe here, if you have Cyrillic text from 200 years ago, they can probably help you OCR it really well, whereas Tesseract might struggle with some of that. Um, the Tesseract developers, as I said, they were incredibly helpful and responsive. And the same is true for the uh, MUPDF and PyMUPDF people. Um, when I initially set out to do all of this work, I spent two weeks trying all the different tools, and I found bugs basically in every step of the way. There were some MUPDF, some PyMUPDF uh, Py, uh, Py and Tesseract. So I reported the bugs, and by the time I actually got to using it, they fixed them. So that was, uh, that was really awesome. Um, and there's a, a Slack hash OCRG channel at my, my work Slack, uh, but we can invite people if they're interested in, in talking about OCR at, at, uh, or have questions. Uh, send me an email. My email's in the first slides. I'll go back to the first slide at the end if you're, if you're interested in, in joining. There's a couple of things that I think that still need to be improved upon. Uh, the MRC compression works really well, but sometimes it leaves a bit of uh, shade behind every text. So you get a shade effect behind text, and uh, it doesn't, it's not really annoying when you're reading it, but it bothers me. And this simply happens because we don't always fully remove the text from the background image, so it gets still a bit black or the color of the text. So that simply means that we need to improve the mass generation more. Um, but that's not tricky. I've, I've tried that quite a, quite a few times. Um, and something else I'd like to support, which is actually very simple, but I haven't done it yet because we don't need it, is compressing PDFs without any OCR uh, files. So if you don't care about the text layer, but you still have a big PDF that you want to compress or a lot of images, then uh, currently you have to OCR them before you can compress them. But there's no real reason that that needs to happen. What I would personally like to do is um, recode and compress sophisticated existing PDFs. Um, it is not very relevant for, for work, because we don't do that. But um, I don't think there's a good open source tool that takes an existing PDF that you can get from someone. Say they scan the document, and they send it to you, and you want to send it to someone else, but it's too large, or you want to store it, but it's too large. 
uh, we can apply the same MRC compression on an existing PDF. We just find every image in the PDF, we compress it, and replace the image with our compressed images. What we don't support yet in our OCR is image and photo detection. So OCR technically is just about finding text, but it's actually very helpful to know if something is not text but an image or a photo of a camera, because then you can uh, include those images if you make an EPUB, for example, or you can deal, handle the, uh, deal with them differently when you compress them. Uh, we've been working on creating an open access data set of all the books that we have. So we have a lot of books that are old that are no longer, uh, um, that we can distribute freely. And we're trying to make a set of photos and uh, OCR files so that researchers can use them to maybe improve OCR. And finally, what will be very helpful, I think, is to have a way for people who use the Internet Archive to correct our OCR form, uh, files if they find a problem and send it back to us, which is currently, unfortunately, not possible. Uh, but I think that will be very good because then we can also use whatever people correct on our website and take that back when we are doing OCR training, right? So then you can actually improve your OCR by uh, uh, crowdsourcing, so to say. Okay. Uh, so a quick summary of the talk, if you, if you dosed off for most of it. Um, the Internet Archive only uses free software now for its OCR and PDF uh, processing, which is, uh, I'm very happy about. And we, con we contributed an M MRC compression library in Python. Uh, other projects are very free to use that in, for, for their own purposes. But when I was searching for it online, there was, there was nothing. There was nothing that did MRC compression, so uh, we had to write that. We process many millions of pages every day. Sometimes we peak 10 million pages, but usually it's about 3 million. Uh, and we've already produced over 4 million PDFs using the software that I, uh, uh, I've been talking about. And we're very happy to collaborate with anyone to fix bugs or, or improve the software. If you want to work on it, please let me know. Um, I've been talking a lot about how this works for the Internet Archive and how helpful it is for us, but I think a lot of the software that we've written is also very useful for people at home. Uh, what I've started doing is every single uh, letter that I get, I scan it, and then I compress it with my own software and get a text layer, so later on, I can just very easily find the PDFs or copy text or, you know, I no longer have a pile of papers. They're scanned, very nicely compressed. Um, so if you, if you have a need for that kind of stuff at home, uh, this software is probably useful for you. Um, I will take any questions now. Thank you very much, Merlin. Uh, big thanks to Merlin. So if anyone has questions, the microphone is over there. Um, okay. Hello. You mentioned uh, home usage. How hard is it to set up all this stack? Could Do you, you have Docker you? images or something I can just spin up easily? Could you repeat the question? I heard a part of it, but not everything. Oh, uh, how easy is it to set up uh, the stack in a home situation? Um, well, the www slash tesseract thing I linked is actually uh, contains a Docker file because we use Docker internally for building it. Uh, it does have some requirements on how you run it that are specific to us, but um, I, I can help you with, with um, um, making that much easier to use. Everything else is um, pure Python. So if you use virtual env, it should be pretty easy to, uh, to set it up. There's a requirements file, and, and uh, that, that's how I use it when I'm, when I'm testing. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, how does uh, the stack work with non-languages, stuff like mathematical formulas, chemistry, you know, diagrams maybe? Um, does it handle text? Like, do, you, do you need to do something in addition? Tesseract has support for mathematical formulas, but we don't currently have a standardized way of when you upload something telling that it's only math. Mm -hmm. So I think currently it will just probably be picked up as garbage text. But the PDF compression should probably deal with it pretty well because the binarization method will pick up all the lines and, and it probably should come up quite all right. But uh, there unfortunately are no, um, there won't be a selectable <laughs> a formula in, in the PDF. All right, thanks. I would like to say, uh, do you think that <coughs> compression uh, is uh, really uh, good for uh, archival purpose where we need to preserve as much information as possible of the original? Yeah, so... Because MRC, uh, MRC is quite old and quite not so effic effic well, efficacy compression. 
there is a new compression like uh, wavelets, new wavelets. Uh, and for that reason, do you think a little bit to update the concept, not the, you know what I mean, the, the, the idea, the concept. Thank you. Okay, so I think your question was uh, if MRCS compression is too old or if we should really keep more quality, right? Um, and there's, there's a couple different questions there. We keep uh, the images at the highest quality on our servers, and you can download them if the book is uh, um, legally uh, available through, through legal means. You can just download the super high resolution images, but we don't put them in the PDF because people do book lending. And the other problem is they're uh, very new image formats like a AVIF, right? But PDF doesn't support them. So for our PDF purposes, there's, we cannot insert them because there's no PDF reader that can read them and there's no way to insert them in the PDF. No idea was, uh, a question was that is it also um, good for the uh, archival purpose because we, uh, we know that for the archival purpose it's needed to be uh, captured and save it as much uh, details possible but with uh, best uh, compression. Is it suitable for such thing? What do you mean when you say archival post? You said uh, archival purposes. Purposes. Oh, um, archival purposes. Sorry. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't recommend using MRC for for archival purposes. I think um, definitely if you want to, if you want, it, it's pretty lossy, and you can you can make it less lossy, but then you're better off using I think uh, one of the, the newest uh, image formats. Um, yeah. So you mentioned uh, the mask for MRC being binary. Uh, is that really the case? And if it is, how does it prevent jagged lines and aliasing? Um, okay, that's that's a good question. Um, I think the effect of the mask actually often makes it sharper, right? Because you're saying if, if there's a mask that's either on or off, aren't you going to get cut off or weird lines? I think at very low resolutions, that's true. But because we have very large images and we don't actually downscale them, like they're uh, 6,000 by 4,000 pixels for a small book, you don't have that problem because there are many, many pixels in, in every uh, uh, character. Any other questions? Well, um, everybody, big thanks to Merlin. Thank you.